Well, good afternoon to you all. Thank you for coming. I'm going to speak about the Rig Veda and uh, show that it contains just about everything that one may find in the Indo-European, in the other Indo-European languages. Also, it contains anything one may find in any poetry, at any time, in any country of the world. So, um, I enjoy the Rig Veda immensely, and I hope you as Indians will also appreciate its beauty. But, I would like to place this approach in a broader frame, the frame of Indo-Aryan indigenism. Thank you. So I shall first delineate the notion of the Aryan invasion or immigration, as it is now called, theory, and then show that this doesn't really come up to the real facts and will place the Rig Veda or the study, the approach of the Rig Veda in this framework. For the past uh, more than 10 years, 12 years, I've been giving talks, lectures, I've been writing articles and papers in various learned journals, refuting the Aryan invasion or immigration theory and supporting the Indo-Aryan indigenous. In other words, that the Indo-Aryans were here uh, certainly for 5,000 years BCE. BCE means, in the old tradition, before Christ. BCE means before the current era. CE means after the current era. Now, Here you see the gist of the Indo-Aryan invasion immigration theory. It was invasion up until 1995. After 1995, Western mainstream scholars stopped talking about an invasion and began to talk about an immigration. And in recent years, they don't talk about an immigration as such, but as waves of immigrants, small numbers, getting into Sapta Sindhu. Sapta Sindhu is the area where the Vedic people lived in the fourth millennium BCE. Uh, what you see on the map are languages, not really races or people but the languages, the Indo-European languages. Now it's quite possible that among you are people who will want to know about Dravidian, but my studies never took me to Dravidian, so I don't really know very much about Dravidian, so I would beg you not to ask me too much or too detailed questions about Dravidian. My, my field is Indo-European. And here you have all the Indo-European languages, and the dotted line can you hear me at the back? Yes. Yeah? Well, the dotted line shows how the Indo-Iranians, who were regarded as one group, a unified group. Hello? Okay? Yes. Move from the Russian steppe down through the Caucasus mountain, first into Iran, where they settled for a period, and then the Indo-Aryans, what we call the ready people, moved away from there and came to Sapta Sindhu. Uh, however, the very first thing that one will notice is that 
when one begins to study seriously these things, um, yeah, that's better. No text of the Vedic period seems to have a memory of any such trip. The Rig Veda doesn't remember anything. The Yajur Veda, Tharva Veda, the Brahmanas, they don't have any mention of any trip down into Sapta Sindhu. They take it for granted that they always live there and that their ancestors always live there. And you can look up uh, Mandala 4, Hymn 1, Stanza 3, where the Angiras poet talks about his ancestors being here all the time doing the sacrificial rituals here all the time. Then again in Mandala 7, hymn 76-4, the Vasishtas say the same thing. We've always been here, our ancestors have always been here. Now in contrast, if one looks at the Old Testament, which contains the cultural tradition of the Hebrews, the Jewish people, there you find that the describe, the authors describe the trips from southern, Mediterranean, southern Mesopotamia up into northwest and coming into Palestine and meeting various people. They even passed from Egypt and they were held there for some period before they arrived at Palestine. The Avestan people, the old Iranian people, the old Persians, in Avesta, in the second book, I think, they recall that they traveled from 16, from 16 different places before they arrived at their historical habitat in Iran. And then, from Iran, they moved northwest and spread right to Persia. Furthermore, we find that in several mandalas, in several hymns, it is said that the wise people among the Indo-Aryans, among the Vedic people, spread outwards to civilize other people, that they should diffuse the Aryan laws. The Aryas were not a race. The Aryas were the people who followed the Aryan laws, the Aryan way of life. And un Aryas were those who did not follow the Aryan way of life. So among the five tribes of the Vedic people, the five tribes being Anus, Turvasas, Druhius, Purus, and Yadus. These were the five tribes of the Vedic people. Now they live in Sapta Sindhu, uh, in the seven rivers, the system of the seven rivers, with Saraswati as the axis of that system. Now some of these were not Aryas in the sense that they chose not to follow the Aryan way of life. And there were internecine wars between the Anarias and the Aryas. And some of these people, the Anarias, moved away. We'll look into that shortly. Can I have the next one, please? Now, this is a hymn in the sixth mandala which describes in detail the river Saraswati as it flows down and it describes it roaring away and rolling along, flooding and having large waves. And in the ninth stanza, it is said that she, Saraswati, 
has spread us all beyond the other seven sister rivers as the sun spreads out days. So, can I have the next one, please? Here are the five tribes along the rivers, and they spread out according to this particular stanza in that particular hymn. However, Western people ignore all this and insisted that not only did the Indo-Aryans come from outside, but they actually invaded with chariots and weapons the country that we call Sakta Sindhu and conquered it. Next one, please. And here, is, uh, here are two views of two formulations of this idea, one by the linguist Emeno and the other by linguist the Sanskritist Paro. Please read it for just a minute so that I don't need to read it for you. Observe that Emeno is talking about a linguistic doctrine and about arguments. Now, historians speaking about historical events don't talk about doctrines and don't talk about arguments. They present facts. They present data. The same with Barrow, who was an excellent Sanskritist, Sanskritist but an abominable historian. Now, in 1966, George Dales, a Western archaeologist, published an article in the Scientific American in which he showed that, in fact, there had been no invasion at all. That, in fact, the corpses that they found, the skeletons that they found at uh, various uh, places in the uh, Harappan cities, Mohenjo-daro, Kalibangan, and so on, were, in fact, people who died naturally from natural causes, not from battles. And so the arrogance of these scholars was belied by archaeological facts. Now this should have made linguists a little bit more humble and more careful in their formulation, but it didn't. They continued to claim that there was an invasion. And they continued this, as I said, up until 1995. Anthropological studies, archaeological studies, genetical studies show that in fact there had never been an influx of foreign people until 600 BCE. In the 6th century indeed begin influxes of foreign people first with the Persians who came down and conquered Bactria and Gandhara then came Alexander with his Greeks who came into uh, right up to the Indus. Then came the Shakas and the Pahlavas and so on. But up until 600 there is no evidence, no archaeologists find any evidence of entry, anthropologists do not find any evidence and above all geneticists find no evidence whatsoever. On the contrary, uh, since 2003 and onwards, geneticists repeatedly have done researches into the DNA and the various other molecular uh, presences in the human organ, and they find that there has been no inflow of foreign genes into the Indian subcontinent. So we can rest assured upon that. Can we have the next one? Here we have the a summing up, archaeologists, anthropologists, genetic studies. Some aspects of linguistics also support indigenity because consider that the whole of Sakta Sindhu was Sanskritized. The 
mountain called Himawat is a Sanskrit word. Hima means cold or snow, and Wat means having light. The rivers, Saraswati, means a river which has eddies, pools, currents. Purushni, uh, Drishadvati, and so on. They are all Sanskrit names. So are the names Vishwamitra, it should have been long A, Vishwamitra, Bharadvaja, Vasishta, and so on. These are all Sanskrit names. Now, if the Indo Aryans were coming in small waves of people, you know, a hundred people, fifty people, two hundred people, how could they have Sanskritized all that area? Now, have you any idea how large Sapta Sindhu was in that time? If you take Germany and France together, that is the area. Very, very large area. So how could they Sanskritize the native population? Why would the native population abandon their own language and take on the language of the invaders or the immigrants? Especially if the immigrants come, you know, drop by drop. It does not make any sense at all. I shall now examine the Rig Veda applying what's called the preservation principle. Because a language which preserves most from the parent language, a language among many other sister languages which presents most from the parent language is entitled to be regarded as the language that stayed put and did not move much. Whereas the other languages who have lost much must have moved much in order to have lost much. Why? Because in those days there were no books, there was no wireless and no television, there was no Ministry of Education issuing edicts that this should be studied and that should be studied. It was all oral tradition. So, if you are on the move, you don't have time to sit down with your children and teach them the sacred law that you have traditionally. If, on the other hand, you stay put, then you have time to sit and teach the children what they should know. So, those who move away, because they move, they don't have much time, and so they lose much of the traditional law. Those who stay put have much time, and therefore can't teach the children the tradition, and so the preservation will be greater. Do you follow me? Good. Next one, please. Now, here you have three theonyms. Theonyms means uh, names of gods. Agni, Aryaman, and Diaos. Now, the name Agni appears in Hittite as Agni. Hittite is another Indo-European language. In Slavonic, Slavonic is also another Indo-European language, it's Ogon. And then the word fire appears in Latin Ignis, Lithuanian Ugnis, Lettonian or Latvian Ugum, and they all mean fire. Even the Iranians, although they had lost the god of fire, Agni, yet they preserved the, a proper name, Dasht Agni. So Agni is there in Dasht Agni. Now, Hittite has Bahur, 